So the topic of today's lecture is radiation biology of hypofractionation. And the question is why? Why do we need radiation biology for higher dose? Well, it seems there's a new biology that might be taking place, a new biology that explains how things happen at a high dose, which is different than at a lower dose. So this is Detroit. My hospital is behind the large buildings. The picture was taken from Canada, which is where I live. And this river is the Detroit River. And that empties into a lake. And that's Lake Erie. Beyond that is another lake, Lake Ontario. Between those two lakes is Niagara Falls. In a later lecture, uh, you will be introduced to uh, high dose radiation, which I'm sure you're all familiar with. But I put this slide up to emphasize the doses. So whether it's a single dose, stereotactic radiosurgery, or multiple doses, two to five, or whether the dose is SBRT, body radiation, all the doses are above, and it seems that above 10 gray, some strange things happen. Of the lecture are to one, review classical radiobiology, what concepts govern radiation cell killing. Two, to review the new biology so we can understand what happens at higher doses. And three, to present future directions, maybe even enhance tumor response further. And so my outline is first to talk about the biology of the cell's response to radiation. And this is categorized by five rows of radiobiology. The repair, that's the DNA repair. The reassortment of cells within the cell cycle, because cells in the cell cycle have different radiation responses. Reoxygenation, because oxygen is the most potent sensitizer of radiation damage. Repopulation, that's the growth of the tumor. And then finally, more recently, it's been identified radiosensitivity. The intrinsic radiosensitivity would change at higher doses. The second is the biology of high dose radiation. And there's many theories on what's going on at high dose radiation. And this is an area of active research. So I'll just uh, talk about uh, what's been published and a little bit about future work. So some people say there's a direct vascular injury that occurs above 10 gray. Others say, no, no, it's not a direct effect. It's an indirect effect on the blood vessels, and that kills cells. That kills cells days after the radiation exposure. And then other people say, no, no, it's, it's immunology that explains why high-dose radiation works so well. And there's probably other explanations, but the point is, we don't know. We just think that there's things that happen differently. And finally, future direction. So by way of background, radiation generates free radicals, chemical species, which are short-lived, and damage cells, either directly or if they interact with water, then indirectly. After all, water is the most abundant component of the cell. And so since radiation interacts in a probabilistic way, in a random way, it has the most probability of interacting with water. And radiation is, of course, like a billiard ball that just rips through whatever's there, and it hydrolyzes the water. It breaks it up into its components. But there's no consequence. The water usually just recombines and no harm. 
the water may the radiation may also interact with proteins of the cell or lipids that and again this doesn't have consequence because we have lots of duplicate protein lipid and carbohydrates but if the radiation interacts with dna we only have one double stranded copy of dna in our cells and that's lethal so if the radiation interacts directly with the DNA, that's quite rare, but that will have consequences. But more often, it interacts indirectly with water. And water interacts with the DNA, the water radicals. But for this to happen, it has to be close. It has to be within a few nanometers. And this has implications for a new type of radiation observation called flash radiation, which I'd love to talk about in a separate lecture. So this just uh, puts things in perspective. Uh, the cell has a nucleus, the nucleus has chromosomes, and the chromosome is, is wound up DNA. That's the target of radiation, that if it interacts with DNA randomly, then it's a lethal event. Are there any questions? So that's background. So now for the four R's of radiotherapy. The first is repair. At low doses, uh, radiation cell killing is due to a double strand break. And that's considered to be lethal because the second strand of DNA is a kind of a insurance policy. If one strand is broken, the other one is a template that can be used for repair. But if both strands are broken, then the cell dies. And since increasing cell killing is proportional to the amount of radiation at the low doses, we consider it to be a double strand break. So at low doses, cell survival is a function of the radiation dose and follows the relationship that it should be not surviving fraction, but the, the amount of cell kill is proportional to the radiation dose. Since a single hit, a double strand break, causes cell killing. At higher doses, radiation cell killing is a consequence of accumulated damage, many or at least two single strand breaks that are close enough together or other types of DNA damage close enough that it causes death of the cell. And so here the number of the amount of killing is proportional to the radiation dose squared since cell death is a consequence of two single strand breaks hence the dose squared. At very high doses it's much more complex and it's not clear if a new biology is needed or if it follows the same rules. And that's because at very high radiation doses, there's a lot of error in the measurement. And so it's hard to discern, hard to get good data. So in summary, for the majority of radiation doses that are typically encountered in the clinic, the surviving fraction of cells is related to the dose as the surviving fraction is E to the minus, and here alpha is a constant of proportionality times the dose, minus beta, another constant, dose squared. And this uh, relationship of alpha constant over beta constant gives us insight into the response of all normal tissues to radiation. Interestingly, all normal tissues fall into one of two categories a small alpha beta and a large alpha beta. And that's the subject of another lecture too. So the alpha dose dominates at the low doses and the beta dose squared dominates at the higher doses. I've plotted a cell survival or surviving fraction as a function of radiation dose. And on the left, it's a linear curve showing that increasing radiation causes a decrease 
in the number of cells that survive. Note that at the low doses, it's just accumulating damage. It's not, it's not um, causing a, as fast a cell kill as at the higher doses, it's uh, much steeper. Oops. That same data shown on a semi-log plot just shows that there's a shoulder region and a straight line portion. Or if you will, from alpha beta, there's a low dose where the surviving fraction is, can be fit to a straight line characterized by an alpha D and a curvy region, a quadratic, where the curve is characterized by this beta term D squared. Of course, the bigger the beta, the more curvy this is. So for repair, there's two definitions that are operational. It just helps us understand what's going on. But repair is repair. The molecules that are involved are the same. It was found that cells growing in a dish that were irradiated would repair the damage if allowed to. But if the media was changed, if the cells were given fresh media, it was found that their repair was different. So my question is, would you expect nice, fresh media replaced to cells, a nice environment to replaced, given to cells that are irradiated, would you expect them to die more or less? Any thoughts? Well, surprisingly, the answer is that cells die more, even though the environment is nice and the cells feel happy, they shouldn't. They should stop and they should repair their damage. And because they feel good, they, the cells try to divide and they shouldn't. They should have stopped and repaired. And when they divide, that's when they die. So that's called potentially lethal damage if the environment changes after irradiation. And the other important term is sublethal damage, and that happens between two doses of radiation. The closer two doses of radiation, the more damage occurs. If you separate two doses of radiation in time, you actually get more repair and you actually get more survival. So sublethal damage is very important to conventional fractionated radiation, where you give a dose of radiation every day, you're expecting that the cells, hopefully in normal tissue and not in, as much in tumor, are going to repair. And so normal tissue will be repaired and feel better day by day, and the radiation in the tumor will accumulate. Solo quiero recordarles a todos que están escuchando que mantengan tus micrófonos apagados porque vamos a, estamos teniendo mucho ruido y está interrumpiendo la presentación. Obvio, vamos, tenemos mucha gente, pero estamos a, a intentando de mantener todos. Pero por favor, hay un botón que está para la izquierda, abajo de tu pantalla donde ustedes pueden apagarlo. Entonces, por favor, que lo apaguen. Uh, yeah. Y también, we, we, also, we also do have a uh, question for Dr. Brown. It, it's, a, it's a question that, is, excuse me one second. One, so, so for survival fraction of higher doses, the, there is more cell death than lower doses? Correct. So the, so, well, that's not true. So the surviving fraction is, is um, the surviving fraction are the cells that survive. So at higher doses, the surviving fraction is actually proportional to inverse, inversely proportional to dose because if you increase the dose, you get less surviving fraction. So the correct equation is shown, but when I show the relationship that surviving fraction is proportional to dose, or surviving fraction is proportional to dose squared, that should have been cell kill is proportional to dose. 
cell kill is proportional to dose squared. So thank you for pointing that out. No problem. Thank you. Okay, so to put things in perspective, when we talk about repair, um, it's very important to consider the time involved. That repair has a half time of one to two hours. And so it's an important consideration compared to the other R's of radiotherapy. Okay, um, cells in different phases of the cell cycle have different both repair capacities and also that's really because of the time involved. So for example, you know the cell cycle is Let's start with after mitosis. There's a G1 arrest, or a G1 where the cells are just more uh, rapidly growing, metabolically active. There's an S phase where the DNA is being made, and then G2, another gap, and then mitosis. And cells are very sensitive in late G2 and mitosis, but not as sensitive to radiation in S phase. The reason is because of repair. There's a lot of time for the cells in S phase when the, the DNA is open and the DNA is being synthesized. There's lots of time for repair to occur and also the DNA is open so it's easier to repair the damage. In G2, there's really little time before mitosis. If the cell divides, it replicate, its DNA is going to its daughter cells and it's replicate, it's uh, sent in equal amounts to the daughter cells. And if there's damage in one, it's gonna cause consequences for the daughter cell. It, the cell may die. And so the manifestation of radiation injury occurs when the cells try to divide. And this is very important to understand the response of tissue to radiation. Late responding tissues like brain does not divide much and so it takes a long time for the cells to divide and therefore they have a lot of time to repair any damage that occurs whereas cells like the bone marrow or the germ cells or hair is rapidly dividing not much time for repair and so the manifestation of the injury what you see happens when the cell divides, and that happens early. So they're termed acutely responding tissues. So the point here is that it takes about 24 hours for the cells to go through the cell cycle. And so cells in different parts of the cell cycle are sensitive, and we'll come back to why that's important. Dr. Brown? Yes. A uh, quick question. In terms of the higher doses, is it the alpha or beta that is more dependent on higher doses? So this is an interesting question because the conventional wisdom is that beta is at higher doses, but it takes two hits. So it's two, two pieces of damage just by random that happen to be close together that cause death. Whereas alpha is at the low dose range. The problem becomes, when I went to school, we learned a different model, not the alpha-beta, not the linear quadratic model. We learned about the single-hit multi-target model. In the single-hit multi-target model, the cell survival can be completely explained by a shoulder region and a straight line portion. The problem becomes, the shoulder region, which is the low dose region, is in the single hit multi target model, corresponds to uh, repair. Whereas in the linear quadratic model, the beta term, the curviness at the high dose, corresponds to repair. Each one is separate and each is just a model that helps you understand what's going on. And if in real life, you just have to break it down to what question you're asking and what information the models give you. 
but realize these are just models. So to answer your question easily, the beta in the alpha beta model is at high dose or dominates at high dose. Thank you, Dr. Brown. Oh, you're welcome. Okay, so the next slide. Okay, the third R of radiobiology is very important. Oxygen is the most important or the most potent radiation sensitizer. So the question I have to the audience is, how big is this? Is this a 20%? In other words, cells that have oxygen, would you expect them to be 20% more sensitive, two times more sensitive, or 20 times more sensitive? I'll let you translate, Michael. So, <clears throat> Este, eh, la, la pregunta es, eh, si el oxígeno en el célula hace que el célula llegue a ser más sensitivo a la radiación, ¿por qué nivel? ¿Es 20 porcentaje más sensitivo dos veces, tres veces o 20 veces más sensitivo? ¿Alguien sabe cuál es? Maybe we should just continue. Ok. <laughs> so the answer is twice as effective. In other words, you need half the radiation dose to get the same effect in the presence of oxygen than in the absence. And why this is important is there's regions of the tumor that are at low oxygen. These crazy tumor cells consume whatever they can, use up all their oxygen, and become resistant to radiation. So this is shown in the figure, surviving fraction as a function of radiation dose, and cells that are at low oxygen are very resistant. It takes a big dose of radiation to kill just a little bit of them, whereas cells that are well oxygenated are sensitive to radiation. But for radiotherapy, conventional radiotherapy, this is extremely important and the reason, one of the reasons why we fractionate. The verdict is out for high-dose radiation. Some people say it's very important. Other people say no. Why is it not important? Because, my gosh, we give a huge dose of radiation, and if there were any hypoxic cells there, you would think that they would dominate at the higher doses, and yet we're able to cure tumors with high-dose radiation as SRS or SBRT. And so the question is, is oxygen important? From fractionated radiation, we know it absolutely is. And I'll show some intriguing data from uh, Chang Song's lab suggesting it is very important to high-dose radiation. Okay, so this figure shows that cells close to a blood vessel are well oxygenated, and even 70 microns, much less 0.7 of a millimeter, less than a millimeter away from the blood vessel, the cells become hypoxic and then anoxic, no oxygen. And those are the ones we worry about, the hypoxic cells. Still alive, but at low oxygen. So my question to the audience, and Michael, maybe you can uh, translate, is why is it that oxygen can't diffuse further than 70 microns if you wait long enough, why doesn't it eventually reach the hypoxic cells? Okay. <clears throat> bueno, la pregunta es, ¿por qué llegar a 70 uh, micrometers? <laughs> yes. De, del, uh, más de 70 micrometers del vena. And so the answer is that... <laughs> I, I guess it's because of the high consume of oxygen by the tumoral cells. That's why they consume the oxygen uh, closer to the arterial end, and then they leave another part uh, anoxic. That's my theory. Thank you. Absolutely right. Correct. That the cells close to the blood vessel are alive, and they consume the oxygen. Thank you. Perfect. So as I said, uh, fractionated radiation, consisting of multiple small doses, allows for reoxygenation to occur. And this happens, uh, a capillary can grow about a millimeter a day. 
So a question is, can reoxygenation happen with high dose radiation? And yes, absolutely. But if it's a single dose, then there's no chance for reoxygenation to occur. Okay, the fourth R is repopulation, which is just the growth of the cells. And this takes a long time. This takes six to eight weeks or however, you know, months. And so it's really not a concern for SBRT and SRS, of course, in the time afterwards it is. So in summary, the four, maybe five R's, and I didn't talk about radiosensitivity, is repair, which occurs in hours, reassortment, the whole cell cycle takes a day. Reoxygenation can occur over hours to days. And repopulation, which is more like weeks or months. And then uh, our cells just more sensitive to high dose radiation. That's really the topic of the second part of the talk. So in summary, if we plot the surviving fraction of cells as a function of time between two doses of radiation, the cell, the Regiment is most effective when there's no time between the two doses. We kill the most cells. The surviving fraction is lowest when there's no time between the doses. As we start to spread out the time between doses, repair can take place from the first dose to the second. And that repair will mean the surviving fraction increases. Less cells die. And that will go until there's 100% repair. As much repair as can take place takes place. And so there's a maximum. Then because the cells are cycling through different parts of the cell cycle that have different sensitivities to radiation, cells in S phase will be resistant. Cells in late G2M will be sensitive. And those cells that are sensitive will die. But those that are resistant will move into the sensitive phases of the cell cycle just when the second dose of radiation comes. And that happens at hours, say six hours in this graph, where you almost get as much killing as if you gave the two doses of radiation together. And that's because of reassortment of cells in the cell cycle. So the first R of radiotherapy is repair. The second is reassortment. Both have a profound effect on the survival, a log of cell kill. And then repopulation, those are cells that just grow. Of course, that happens after the radiation. And uh, reoxygenation and radiosensitivity are the others. So just because of the time frame involved, I would think that repair and reoxygenation and maybe intrinsic radiation sensitivity are the ones that we would worry about for high-dose SPRT or SRS radiation. Okay, just a word about radiosensitivity. This is the intrinsic radiation sensitivity. And it turns out that all mammalian cells have about the same intrinsic radiation sensitivity. It takes about one to two gray to reduce surviving fraction to 37%. Why 37%? That's for logarithmic relationships. E to the minus one is very convenient. It's used in many areas of science. And so 37% is a convenient number for random processes that are expressed on a logarithmic scale. But the point is, there's not much difference in radiation sensitivity from cell line to cell line. So could changes in the radiation sensitivity explain the success of SBRT or stereotactic radiotherapy? And here, I just wanna convince you that amazing things are happening at high doses. So, of course, it's gaining momentum. That's why you're interested in it. It's easier on the patients. It costs less. And there's some good responses. So for brain tumors, at least metastatic brain tumors, if they're small, less than three centimeters in maximum diameter, producing less than a one centimeter midline shift, it's considered standard to give stereotactic radiotherapy uh, instead of whole brain radiation. This comes out of uh, the paper by Linsky, where he compared systematically a review of the evidence and showed that with up to three metastatic brain tumors, there was, it was superior, high dose radiation was superior to whole brain radiation. But as I mentioned before, if tumor hypoxia is a problem, why does it work? If 
radiation is very effective at killing oxygenated cells. And the ones that survive the radiation treatment are at low oxygen, then it shouldn't work. It shouldn't be that good. And if fractionated radiation strategies can overcome tumor hypoxia using this process of reoxygenation, then SRS or stereotactic radiotherapy should not be so effective. But it's true that tumors that don't respond to conventional radiation, melanoma, renal cell carcinoma, anaplastic thyroid cancer, we don't give conventional radiation for melanoma. It doesn't work. But when those same tumors spread to the brain and we give this high-dose radiation, they melt away, at least as well as so-called sensitive radiation uh, tumors. So what's going on? Regardless of the histology, the high-dose radiation seems to work. If we could understand why it works so well, if we could understand the biology, then we could optimize the parameters, the best radiation dose, the best number of fractions, the best dose per fraction, that is. And then if we knew what was going on, we could exploit the biology by, say, combining with some agents to get more cell kill, more better tumor response, better cure rates. So that's the thinking. Now, this is, as I said, an area of intense research. And so what I'm showing now is not, it's not known 100%, but there's very intriguing data that needs to be confirmed in patients. And so the data that I show from here on is from animal studies. So there's a number of explanations that have been proposed based on animal studies to explain why high-dose radiation works so well. And the questions that people ask are, are the tumor vessels very sensitive to the radiation? Does chronic anoxia occur days after radiation? If the radiation kills the oxygenated cells, then maybe anoxia, low oxygen, zero oxygen, persists, and that would be cytotoxic. Is the, the immune system involved? There's a lot of interest in using the immune system to increase the tumor response. There are those that say there is no new biology that's needed. We can explain everything from the alpha beta model that I presented earlier. And there may be other explanations too. So I'm going to go through each one of these briefly. And it's just an overview, but I'm happy to give papers that support each one of these. So the first question is, do the blood vessel cells, do the cells in the tumor that line the blood vessel, are they sensitive to radiation? And if they are, that could explain why radiation at high doses is so effective. Well, a big group at Sloan Kettering Cancer Institute in New York, uh, headed by Zivi Fuchs and Richard Kolosnik, showed that yes, indeed, the endothelial cells that line the vessels are very sensitive to radiation. And they published this in a landmark paper in Science. They showed that the endothelial cells die by a process called apoptosis that is not governed by P53, which is the policeman of the cell, the protein that's mostly responsible for apoptosis. So this was an apoptotic pathway that didn't include P53, very unusual. It included instead a different protein called acid spindle myelinase. I won't go into the details, they're here and, and in the paper in science, but the point is when they knocked out this protein in cells and they exposed the tumors to radiation, they found they were no longer sensitive to radiation. So that's shown here. They had groups of animals that had the protein and didn't have the protein. So plus plus and minus minus. And this is tumor volume as a function of days after implanting the tumor. Radiation was given, big dose, 
15 gray. And if the protein was present, the sphingomyelinase was present, the tumors went down in size. And if it wasn't present, the tumors were not sensitive to radiation. Very convincing. Unfortunately, nobody's been able to repeat this. <laughs> so there's skepticism in the field. It's a very compelling argument, but so far uh, elusive. Okay, what about chronic anoxia days after radiation? So this is from very old data. Uh, Cheng Song is the pioneer in this area, and his student, Robin, Robert Griffin, who is now at the University of Arkansas, uh, did the initial work. Dr. Song did this work back in the 1980s. And since then, he's only repeated and shown that it's very consistent that tumor blood flow decreases one day after a high dose of radiation, and it stays low for days, causing more injury and killing the tumor cells. So he says it's not the sphingomyelinase, but there's something about the tumor endothelial cells or blood vessel cells that are dying and that's causing anoxia, and it's the anoxia that's killing the cells. This is data from 1978, where he shows an, uh, a tumor was taken out of the animal after irradiating, and the cells were grown in the dish. When they were taken out right after the radiation, there was some cell kill due to the radiation, and this was 10 gray of radiation. But if he left the tumor in place and took it out a day later, he got more cell kill. And if he left the tumor in place for two days, took the cells out and grew them in a dish, even less survived. Somehow the cells, when left intact, were dying from the original radiation exposure. And he hypothesized and has since shown that it's due to a decrease in blood flow, a decrease in oxygen, and a decrease in nutrients. And so the cells die because they're starved. They're starved of oxygen and they're starved of nutrients. And then if you wait long enough, blood vessels grow into the area and the number of cells come back. And I sent a recent paper that he has, 2019, showing his most recent data, but it's really just a repeat of this original study that he did. So unfortunately, others have not been able to replicate this, except if they use very large tumors or enormous doses of radiation. And so again, there's some skepticism about this, this explanation, but it's still very compelling. The third is immunology. Maybe it's the immune system that's being primed after a big dose of radiation that produces antigens, and the antigens are expressed, and the immune system gets rid of the, the cancer cells. This was put forth by Sylvia Formenti and Sarah Demaria, who are now both at Cornell. And they showed in a series of papers, and now in clinical trials, that the immune system is very much dependent on its response to radiation and can very much determine a good response and a bad response for some tumors. My problem is what happens in normal tissue? Do you get the same antigens expressed and do you get a response in normal tissue? And so there's some questions that persist, but again, a very compelling argument. And then finally, I wanted to talk about a, a group of very senior scientists that say there is no new biology that's needed at all. We can explain everything using the linear quadratic model. And this is Martin Brown at Stanford, David Brenner, and David Carlson, both in, I believe, New York, Columbia, and I'm not sure where Dr. Carlson's from. So what they did was they went back to all the data previously and plotted it. Whether it was given as a single fraction or multiple fractions, they plotted the tumor control probability as a function of the radiation dose. They found that a single curve could explain all the data. When they used the linear quadratic formula, the alpha beta model, to fit the data, they found they could explain everything that was going on by that model, and there was no new biology that was needed. 
case closed. We don't need a new mechanism. We understand it already. So I want to talk about their data and, and then plant a seed of doubt if I can. So this shows theoretically tumor response as a function of dose. And if you focus on the blue curve, which is under normal circumstances, at low doses, you don't cure any tumors, zero tumor response. At high doses, you get 100% tumor response. And everything in between is a, falls on the sigmoidal shaped curve shown by the blue line. Now, if at some critical dose, say 10 gray, above which something strange happens and the cells become super sensitive to the radiation, that would cause a shift in the curve to the left, similar to the red curve, where above that line, it takes a much lower dose of radiation to cause a better tumor response. And so if this new biology is existing, then the only difference is from the blue line, which is conventional, to this B curve where it uh, starts as blue and ends as red, and in between I just put a black line. So it's just a steeper curve. So if indeed, so if indeed a new biology is taking place, we should be looking for a steeper curve. So let's look at the data again. So this is the data from uh, Martin Brown and David Brenner. And the original one is their black curve showing uh, a nice curve fit. Green triangles are fractionated and the red and well the red are where you would expect a steeper curve. So the question is, is a, a line of best fit through the single fraction steeper than the line of best fit through all the data. And I would just say it's very difficult to know. I don't think you can tell from this data because of the large error bars. And so even though it's a compelling argument that we don't need a new biology, I would argue that we just can't say at this point. There's also many other explanations. It looks like there might be an ischemia reperfusion that's going on, which we proposed years ago, and others now are also suggesting it might happen. What's missing is human data. So what happens in a human? And so many groups are moving towards uh, making these measurements in clinical trials. where We can see what's going on instead of in a controlled animal study. In a real human, what's happening? And so that's where the future is. And so I'll end there and open to any questions that you might have. Thank you very much for the presentation until this point, Dr. Brown. So we're about at an hour. So I wanted to get it, get an idea if, if we can keep going. I, just, I think most people actually, yeah, most people want to keep going. Okay. Um, I believe you have about 20, 20, 25 slides left, but everybody is wanting to keep going. So real quick, I'll ask them if there's any questions. Bueno, nosotros tenemos más o menos 20, 25 slides más para esta presentación. En este momento, hay una pregunta que alguien quiere hacer para Dr. Stephen Brown. Ok, entonces vamos a seguir. Normalmente estas lecturas terminan a la hora, pero esa es la, la lectura que tiene la más cantidad de información, entonces lleva un poco más tiempo. Para los demás es muy informativo. Entonces, es, eh, espero que puedan seguir uh, escuchando. <coughs> Okay. Oh, wait, we actually do have a question. So is there a relationship, Dr. Brown, between the reduction of the tumor size and the, and the, and the R's of the four R's of radiotherapy? That's a great question. So let's break that down. So the cellular repair uh, would not really change depending on the size of the tumor the oxygen levels would and reoxygenation would the bigger the tumor is the more anoxia and lower amounts of oxygen is there so yes that would matter 
the number of cells that are cycling, you may argue that in a large tumor with a lot of necrosis, you might have less cycling cells or cells that are quiescent, that are stuck in their cell cycle. Whereas a small tumor that's just growing and trying to establish itself may have all cells that are populating and proliferating. And then growth, repopulation, yes, small tumors do grow faster than larger tumors. Tumors seem to reach a certain size and then grow slower. It's um, been modeled by a fellow named Gompertzian, and so it's called Gompertzian growth. At very small, when the tumor is very small, it grows slowly. There's an exponential, whereas really any time that we see the tumor, it's an exponential growth. But at the high end, when it's very large, it grows slower. And so, yes, the, I would say two of the four R's can be affected by tumor size. Thank you very much for that explanation. I think we can actually continue on now. Okay. Well, the rest of the lecture is just fun stuff. We did some studies in our lab showing that this idea that ischemia, ischemia reperfusion may be going on in the tumor and that that could explain some of the findings. And recently, just last year, it's been confirmed by other groups. And so I'll just go through some of those studies. And there's really just two or three slides that I want to focus on. These studies were done in rats. They were done by Jim Ewing and myself at Henry Ford Hospital. And we have a grant from the um, National Institute of Health to pursue these studies. We measured blood flow using magnetic resonance imaging. Now, I live in Canada and we have one MRI machine for the whole city. At work at Henry Ford, I have one MRI machine. Just so we measure blood flow by magnetically tagging the blood entering the brain and watching the decay of that blood with time as it moves out of the field. If it moves away quickly, then blood flow is high. And if it moves away slowly, blood flow is low. And the measurement is quantitative. It's called arterial spin labeling, and it can be used in people. So yes, it's a relatively new method of measuring perfusion in tissue. We gave 20 gray, massive dose, to rats, and these are the details. We looked at blood flow two hours after radiation, four hours, eight, 12, and 24 hours after radiation. What we found was that 20 gray is enough to increase survival. So this is percent survival in our animals and time after radiation. This tumor model is a brain tumor grown in the brain of rats. It's a human brain tumor. And, and animals die within a couple of months after implantation. But with radiation, you can extend survival. So it's a good model of, of a primary tumor. And this is the, the take home pay. A percent of change in tumor blood flow as a function of time after radiation. And blood flow, surprisingly to me, dropped like a rock after radiation. I personally didn't expect to see much changes because after all, it's blood vessels are uh, not particularly sensitive to radiation and we don't see big changes in blood flow. At least naively, I thought we didn't see big changes, but uh, in tumor, it's, it was, in every animal, in every study, and in now multiple tumors, we see the same thing. Blood flow drops like a rock, and, and so the question is, does this happen in humans? And the verdict is out, but within a year, we'll have that answer. At some time later, the blood flow is up above where it was, where it started. And so this low blood flow, high blood flow, if, it, if that happened in a brain, if that was a stroke and you had ischemia reperfusion, or if that happened in the heart after a heart attack, ischemia reperfusion, that would be horrible. That would cause all kinds of free radicals to be formed, lots of extra damage, and it would be devastating. But my goodness, if that happens in a tumor, that could completely explain these remarkable results that we're seeing. 
in tumors that typically are not radiation sensitive, but seem to be melting away with high dose radiation. So we were very excited to see this. But unlike any other hypothesis, there's a differential effect of this phenomenon in tumors and in normal tissue. In normal tissues, I show change in tumor blood flow. It should be change in normal tissue, normal brain. We did not see much change. Normal brain blood flow fluctuates plus or minus 20% under the best of conditions, and that's what we saw. Sometimes a little low, sometimes a little high, but not much change. When the data is plotted together, you can see that the tumor is quite low, goes high, and the normal tissue may be a little low, but maybe a little high, but more or less, plus or minus. So again, very exciting. The first time a differential physiological effect has been shown after radiation, and only if the dose is more than 10 gray. If we drop below 10 gray, we don't see this effect. We also looked at other parameters, that's, uh, that's permeability and extravascular space. Um, and, and this just shows in the tissue, uh, we did see massive damage. So under normal circumstances, the tumors well-packed cells, but after this big dose of radiation, even two hours after this big dose of radiation, just massive damage within the tumor. And we did see some evidence of apoptosis, the P53 dependent apoptosis. So anyway, it was a new phenomena, and what does it mean? Well, it turns out that a couple decades ago, a group at a very famous lab, the Gray Labs in the UK, looked at ischemia reperfusion in tumors. They did this not by using radiation, even though they were a radiation group. They did it by physically clamping the tumors. They put a tourniquet around a leg of a mouse that had a tumor and they physically reduced blood flow to that tumor. And they found that that by itself uh, wasn't uh, killing, but when they opened it up and allowed uh, blood flow to reperfuse, that caused a lot of damage. The reason they say that is when they gave superoxide dismutase or catalase that scavenged the free radicals, they didn't see much damage. So they attributed extra cell kill in a tumor. They showed that you could get extra cell kill in a tumor by an ischemia reperfusion directly. And so this gives some credence to the idea, wow, if high dose radiation causes ischemia reperfusion, that can really affect the tumor response as Parkins and his colleagues showed in the 1990s. So this is the group of papers that came out of that group, a series of papers all showing that ischemia reperfusion had huge consequences in a tumor. And then this is just a schematic that gives you something to think about, you know, what happens in ischemia reperfusion? Well, under ischemia, ATP is converted to ADP and AMP, the cells eventually hypoxanthine is produced. And that's fine, that doesn't cause a lot of damage by itself. But in the presence of oxygen, this hypoxanthine is converted to xanthine by xanthine oxidase, combines with oxygen, and causes all kinds of damaging free radicals, including hydrogen peroxide and nitrogen free radicals, and these are very damaging. And so if ischemia reperfusion occurs after radiation, after a big dose of radiation, it could have huge consequences. So, and then this just shows that the high dose of radiation by itself causes free radicals, cell kill, and that we could actually capitalize on this. We could give drugs that increase the amount of free radicals and cause more damage. And then recently, I did a study using a drug that kills cells at low pH at low, low acidity and at low glucose, and found that when that was combined with high dose radiation, much more cell killing occurred. So these drugs are available, they're used in people, they're FDA approved, metformin is one of them, 
And if combined in the right timing and sequence with, radi with high dose radiation, the results can be dramatic. And so I would say high dose radiation by itself has a lot of potential, but adding it to drugs that capitalize on the mechanisms of high dose radiation killing can increase the amount of cell killing preferentially in the tumor and not in normal tissue. So there's a lot of hope that uh, this work will translate to humans and I hope in the future to be able to present that. Thank you very much. I'd be happy to entertain any questions. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Brown. We actually do have one question and you kind of mentioned earlier there would have there would really be a lecture of its own, but there was a question of what is the relationship between flash radiotherapy and conventional radiotherapy concepts? Ah, that's a terrific question. So flash radiation is an observation that when the dose of radiation is given in a very short time, less than a second, much less than a second, it seems to cause just as much damage in the tumor, but it seems to spare normal tissue. And uh, most people were skeptical of this, but now it's been shown in uh, cells in a dish, in small animals, in large animals that have cancer, pets, in pigs, pig skin, and now one human has been treated in France or Switzerland on the border. And so it's hard to ignore it that this flash radiation, when all the radiation, not a high dose, just the typical dose, whatever dose you would normally give, 30, 40, 50 gray, but when it's given in a very short time, it seems to have some properties that are almost too good to believe. Well, of course, from a biologist's point of view, this is very interesting. What's going on? The conventional wisdom is that if everything's happening so fast, there's no time for these free radicals to travel to the DNA. The radiation is there and gone within a, a fraction of a second. And so there is no indirect effect. It's all the direct effect. And so if the cells have the capacity to repair damage at the site of the DNA, and there's some molecules like glutathione that have SH compounds, which scaven free, rad free radicals, that maybe normal cells have more of those, and so normal cells are protected, whereas tumor cells aren't. That's a hypothesis that has not yet been tested. But what people are showing, this is Chuck Lamoli at uh, San Diego, at Irvine in California, that you get more damaging free radicals in the tumor than you get in the normal tissue. And he's isolated hydrogen peroxide as kind of a key molecule. And he shows that, that you get less hydrogen peroxide in normal tissue and that that's why it's spared. So anyway, it's a very interesting area, flash radiation. I'm sure we'll be hearing more of it. Um, if you could give the whole dose of radiation in less than a second, uh, that would have tremendous implications. Of course, the danger is that you treat the wrong area and that would be horrible. Yeah, I can tell you just this past week, I was at a conference in South in Southern California and one of the presenters was one of the pioneers of flash and he was uh, showing us basically everything he did and he he essentially found that around 20 gray per second which is a dose rate of 20 gray per second there seems to be this this jump in this effectiveness of flash and it's and it's basically like 15 gray per second not much but 20 gray per second this, this, this flash effect. Um, and to give you an idea, a normal radiotherapy um, delivery um, is in the order of 0.15 gray per, uh, per minute. And we're talking 20 gray per second. And he was showing how you had to get up to orders of hundreds of gray per second to, to kind of induce the same kind of damage 
which is a conventional radiotherapy uh, technique would do. But, but yeah, it would spare the, the normal tissue and you actually have very high cell damage. So it was very, very intriguing. The, the main issue that they're having now is just some, is the engineering of how to build machines that can do that. Yeah, if he can build, if, if the machines can be built, everybody will jump on board. <laughs> Yeah. So even uh, Henry Ford Hospital is having a new cancer center. The old machines are being moved to the new cancer center, and one will be left behind and converted to be able to do flash radiation. So everybody seems to be interested in this. Yeah. The presenter, they have a sort of working model for electron therapy. You can get high currents, obviously, with electrons, much higher currents than, than say, uh, photon therapy because photon you you lose a lot of your energy when you when you have the electrons impacting the target to produce the, produce the photons so the problem with having photon flash is the enormous amount of heat that's generated so that's that's the engineering side and the problem with electrons is their penetration is so low yep yep so you're left with only you can deliver slash flash to to surface uh, mm -hmm. Now. Right, but it's a fascinating area, and uh, yeah, a lot of people are interested in this. It it will either revolutionize radiotherapy, or will be a flash and disappear. <laughs> Hopefully not. Hopefully not. Yeah. Bueno, hay más preguntas. Ustedes pueden abrir sus micrófonos o ponerlas en el chat. Wait one second, see if there's any more questions. Okay, with that, I think we can conclude this session. We are incredibly grateful, Dr. Brown, for this uh, presentation. It was very clear, very uh, concise. I, I appreciate how you presented. You pr you spoke very clearly. All the the attendees said that they were able to understand you very well. So greatly. Oh, great. Well, thank you so much. I really appreciate the opportunity to talk about this. Yeah, and we had we had. At one point, I think I saw a high of 97 participants, which is absolutely fantastic. Wow. So, I would like to thank everyone that's joined. Muchas gracias a todos ustedes que están conectado para esta presentación. Muchísimas gracias. Estoy yo aprendiendo cómo manejar todo eso. Entonces, les pido que tengan paciencia conmigo y este y este esfuerzo. Pero están muy agradecidos para que sepan. A la próxima semana, el 4 de febrero, para el programa que usamos de planificación que se llama PRONO, que está en el, un página de web. Vamos a mandarles un link para que puedan conectarse a esa página de web. Por, el, por ello, vamos a revisar casos en vivo, y los contornos y, y todo lo dosis y todo eso. Ese es, va a ser un capacitación de cómo usar PRONO. Será el 4 de febrero la semana que viene. Otra vez a Dr. Brown. Thank you very much, Dr. Brown. Thank you, Michael. And thank you, everybody, for listening.